I would formally like to introduce Professor Sue Gathercole, um, who is a cognitive psychologist, and her biography tells me she has interests in memory and learning, including causes of specific learning difficulties in children and how they might be overcome. She's held academic posts in Oxford, Lancaster, Bristol, Durham, which I'm particularly pleased about because that's my university, uh, York and Cambridge. And then since 2011, she has been the director of the Medical Council Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at Cambridge. The current projects examine the cognitive mechanisms of working memory and how they might be modified through training and investigate through a new research clinic the dimensions of cognitive and brain development that are often impaired in children with problems in attention, learning and memory. Susan became a Fellow of the British Academy in 2014 and was awarded an OBE for her services to psychology and education in 2016. And when you add that to well over 100 publications, books and papers and articles. And the really interesting thing, it's a very small sample because I've not read them all, but each one is actually written for the audience that it's addressed. And that is a real talent. And Sue has done some things that teachers I know find incredibly useful, particularly on the working memory. So please, Sue, can I formally invite you to deliver your lecture? Diagnosis, which diagnosis? Pitfalls and prospects for supporting the struggling learner. Sue Gathical. So it's really great to be here to speak to you today. Um, I had a look at the delegate list and where you all come from, and it's just a, a really interesting group of very, very experienced people. I'm aware I'm standing up as a, <coughs> a jobbing um, research psychologist, really, you know so much more about individual kids than I do. Um, but anyway, let, I'd like to share with you where I think we've got in making sense um, through some of our projects and also through um, quite a lot of the liaison work actually we do with communities such as the ones that you come from, um, particularly back at the, um, <clears throat> the MRC, the Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit, um, in partnership with schools. So um, perhaps it's a mistake, I thought it was this morning, I've stu this is a new talk. So I don't quite know what the next slide is coming up. Well, I know the first slide, but beyond that I don't know. So it might be, it might be a sli slightly uneven. Um, but I wanted to talk about the whole set of issues, really, that we see as our research agenda that we can't possibly address fully, um, about given that so many children struggle to learn, what sense we can make of it and how we can pick apart the possible causes, um, what's tractable, and um, to try and get some um, sort of s systematic way forward in simplifying ways that we can actually identify what can help the individual child. And really, that, that's what we've been trying to do in a variety of different ways. Um, but I'm going to start off, um, these are sort of slightly new slides, giving um, a bit of an overview as to what, what the territory of educational underachievement is, which you all know about anyway. So um, I'm going to give you a few facts about underachievement. And although we think we're doing very well in the UK, um, in the international field, um, I'll place, place our achievements in some context. Um, talk about um, different opportunities that different children have and the impacts that that has on achievement. Um, I, I, as we move forward, I'd like to talk about cognitive issues, um, some of the cognitive problems that many children with learning difficulties have, and some of the sort of accidental routes by which um, help is sought eventually, quite often in desperation by parents and schools, and um, to try and find other ways, more systematic ways, of actually being able to look at the um, profiles of individual children and actually say, OK, what do we need to know and how do we um, focus our resources effectively on this particular child? Um, I'm not going to talk much about working memory, um, but actually, um, towards the end, um, I'm going to re return to, in a sense, my first love, but sometimes it's my first hate, uh, which is uh, working memory training. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you my current perspective on it, which um, is a bit dark in some respects, but I think there are, there are um, ways forward that we can take from um, the lessons of cognitive training research. And finally, um, what, as you might be able to um, guess from the title too, um, I think I'd like to conclude, as I'm sure most of you would do, that there's no cure for struggling learners. 
Um, there's no magic pill, there's no magic computer program that's going to overcome their problems, no matter how much you target exactly at the right developmental age. And actually, I think what we know least about is compensation. That is, how we can arm children with the right ways to um, develop their own strategies to harness their cognitive strengths when they, when they have them, and almost all kids do have them, and to find um, ways forward that will really help the child um, discover those for themselves. And I think this is particularly pertinent to secondary school children. It's much easier to do research with primary school aged children um, for us. Um, but secondary school children still have those problems and um, in many respects they're much more open to finding other ways around their difficulties. And I think as researchers we haven't really fully addressed that. So there's the talk. Um, so I'm going to start off with just the more general perspective. Um, so, do we have a problem with educational underachievement here in the UK? Um, and this is an extremely interesting report. It was actually published in 2010, but it was a large-scale review of um, national data on literacy and numeracy levels of children in secondary schools in England between 1948 and 2009. And uh, one of the perspectives was, have things changed? Have things gone downhill in terms of maths, for example, or numeracy, or have things improved? And actually, the third bullet point tells you there's um, certainly in the last um, 30 years of that period, there haven't really been any changes in attainment. But what we can see is that there's um, a substantial minority of children, about a fifth of the children um, within our society, who have poorer literacy and numeracy levels and really allow them to have full participation in society. Um, this is an incredibly constant figure. It's a very large proportion of children. Um, and you can see here these are functional levels. So this, <coughs> these um, danger levels are defined as functional levels at or below 11-year-old children. So really at the, the, end, the top primary school end by the time that they're out of the education system. So we clearly have a lot of struggling learners. We also know that if we take children in the UK and we ask how many of them have received um, special support at some point during their educational career um, for um, learning difficulties, then about 18% of children will, will have had that. So it's, um, no matter what way we look at it, it's, it's quite a large number of children who are struggling. And clearly, they need to be um, a focus for us in the education system, and there needs to be a focus for researchers to find out really what we can do about um, to help on their behalf. Um, so you may have heard of PISA, um, the, 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 which is an international survey um, using benchmarks across a number of different countries of attainment levels of um, representative samples of the of populations of the different countries in key areas of the curriculum. And um, don't worry about the fact you can't actually read the, um, the countries here. But you see there's, um, on the left we have maths and we have countries down the side and we have reading in the middle and we have science. And these are the, actually the data for 2015 and it's really ranking of different countries. Um, the PISA reports provide us with all sorts of details about the levels of education attainment across different countries. But I think this is just a particularly interesting way of looking at the data which is looking at the differences um, in between the highest and lowest achievements in children in each of these countries. And it's measured in terms of years of education gap. So um, I, even I can't properly see it along the bottom here. Um, but the, these are in terms of numbers, m numbers of years. Have I got the right? Yes. Um, so th this is probably the best way to look at it. So um, at the bottom we have, um, these numbers don't actually quite, quite correspond to the ones I was expecting to see. The countries that have the smallest gap between the lowest and highest um, achievers have a, a seven year gap. So that's where 18 year olds are, are, have reached the levels of 11 year olds only. And down at the bottom there where we have the, the, the widest margins, the poorest performing countries, um, in these plots, then we have nine-year gaps. And the arrows can point to where England lies within these international league tables. And what we can see is that particularly in maths and science, we're doing pretty poorly, and that there are some very surprising countries that are um, above us. So um, we have Greece, Czech Republic, for example. Um, my eyesight isn't that great. Lithuania. Lithuania, we really, it doesn't correspond to our maybe inflated position about where we are 
in terms of um, education attainment. So clearly, um, there are lessons to be learned, I think, um, of how to ensure that we have best educational practice. So that's one important factor, is are we doing the right thing for the children within the, um, the education system? Another really important factor um, which influences the extent to which children can achieve within, the school, within school is um, their environment and the, the excellence of their birth, and in particular the um, social advantages or social disadvantages that they come armed with. And we know from multiple um, research studies that there are very sizable gaps in the cognitive development of children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, it's particularly keen in language. We see massive differences, particularly in vocabulary and comprehension, but also in more fluid cognitive abilities that aren't directly influenced by what's being taught, as it were, crystallised knowledge. So things like executive functions, the ability to switch attention to be um, strategic, um, attentional control, um, emotional regulation. So we find that children from disadvantaged um, backgrounds are much poorer at re regulating their emotions. Clearly that has an impact on their learning, uh, their long-term memory and their IQ. So these factors are extremely important. And I was really struck by the findings of this study. Um, it's, it's an old study now. I have no reason to believe that the pattern's any different. Um, so this is a study where they looked at a whole set of children, um, initially from 22 months of age. And um, up the, um, the y-axis, what we have is the, um, the ranking in, in centiles of the children on a particular cognitive ability test. And they took two groups of children. They took children who were scoring relatively lowly, low on this cognitive development measure, and they're shown in green, and the children who were performing right up at the 90th centile for their age. 22 months. And then they looked at the children within each of the groups and they banded them according to whether they were high or low socioeconomic status. But they weren't selected on that basis, they were just selected on the basis of their extreme scores. And then they followed them across time. So this is the children's performance at 40 years of age. And what you can see now is that, so we have the kids who were initially doing very well, and we see that the children who have lower socioeconomic status within that group are actually doing less well now than the high SES children. And we can see the same in terms of development in the kids who are performing poorly. And in fact, we can see that the high SES children who are um, low in general cognitive development are now approaching the low SES children who are doing very well to start off with. And this pattern just continues. So by the time they're about um, five or six years of age, then we find that um, they meet in the middle. And actually, by 10 years of age, what we find is that the, what's not important is the, um, the cognitive abilities of the children very early in age, but actually the best predictor of how they're doing um, cognitively is their socioeconomic status. So it's an extremely powerful factor. So that's just a broad context. Now, Another critical issue to um, handling, on a national scale anyway, um, the achievements that we can um, generate within the educational system is the systematic approach that we might adopt to education. And um, I've spent quite a lot of time recently in the States and also in Australia, um, where they've very much taken on the response to intervention approach, which many of you may have heard of, but they are applying it incredibly systematically. And this is viewed as the best practice approach, particularly to um, preventing the um, children from f failing to be detected as having learning difficulties and failing to address these promptly. And the recommendation is that this a tiered approach is taken and considered to be a best practice. And this tiered approach is entrenched within the education system as a whole rather than something that, that's helicoptered in for a particular child. So the first expectation, the first tier, for example, in reading instruction, that's one example, is that the instruction that's delivered is the best research-informed effective instruction. So the instruction method shouldn't be chosen on the basis of necessarily the school preference, but on terms, in terms of the best available evidence about what's going to benefit um, children on average um, within that population. So that's what we might reasonably expect of our children when they go to school, that they receive the best research-informed effective education. For children who aren't faring very well at an early stage, 
The second tier of approach is introduced, and that's small group work. So the child might be identified as a group, one of a group of, ch of children who are struggling learners. This often happens within the classroom. And they're given extra instructional focus instruction. Um, weekly monitoring is recommended, so the, where the, the, the child's progress is tracked. And also parental liaison, so where um, information is fed back to the families. The families are also engaged in this, just this early approach to recognising that the child isn't doing too well and maybe needs some extra help, and can be, which can be reinforced at home. And then the third step is intensive in individual in intervention. And this would only be introduced if the first two um, tiers are actually failing and the child still isn't progressing. So unless these first two um, tiers have been adopted, then the third intensive intervention isn't adopted. And then the child might be referred for special education support and maybe um, additional resources to come in. So um, a wholly systematic approach to make sure that children don't slip through the net. And um, really to avoid situations that I think maybe some of us anecdotally, certainly in my own experience of a parent, um, may have had which is that actually quite often you know that a child's struggling, but the school isn't detecting, the school isn't taking um, e extra action. And actually you feel as a parent it's necessary to, to bring that to their attention, but a much more systematic approach where the, the progress of all children is monitored. So this is a good way of making sure that um, resources are effectively and economically um, allocated and actually on a fair basis too. Um, so you'll see that the critical first step is research-informed effective instruction. So what might that be? And there is quite a lot of evidence um, about what can work incredibly well. <clears throat> so, for example, um, the work of Maggie Snowling and Charles Hume and their group, they've done some great work looking at very early interventions, particularly focusing on um, children who are at risk of developing reading problems or who have problems with language. And this is just one of many studies, the Boyer Crane study, that showed that very early phonological training, um, when the children are age four to five in the first year of school, benefits um, literacy development um, in particular. So there's this very close relationship that many of us know about phonological awareness, for example, and the, um, the child's early abilities to get reading up and going, so that vital first step. But also the training in oral language, um, and a sort of flexibility of, of oral language and plenty of open-ended practice with a variety of different exercises, that boosts language abilities too. And there may be something very special about that particular developmental period, that if we're going to focus on language development, then it may be too late four or five years later. Um, so there's a particular developmental period in which the, 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 the system is still fine-tuning, even a typically development developing child and that might be a particularly important point at which to intervene so it suggests that timeliness is really important and that really that sort of timeliness these types of activities are going to be vital for that first step the whole the whole class research informed effective, effective instruction and actually within the UK certainly at the end the phonics end I think we're doing rather well in other countries that's not the case and it's still up for debate um, I just wanted to identify some other um, research evidence, though, that I think is also, also important and I don't think is <coughs> so systematically applied. Um, and I, the, the reference here is to a um, very contentious and, I think, very erudite book written by Joe Elliott and Elena Grigorenko in 2014 on dyslexia um, and really challenging um, current practice in the field of dyslexia. And what they did was they reviewed a very wide range of evidence showing that, I think, showing that phonologicals for reading difficulties are equally beneficial, irrespective of the IQ level of the child. So it's not that they're only effective if the child has typical or relatively high levels of IQ, but the child who is struggling in all respects, including reading and in terms of IQ, will actually benefit to as great an extent with these types of interventions. And that really challenges notions that we might have about something being special about those children who, who have a very marked disparity between IQ and reading and making those a priority for um, our um, very sc scarce resources that, that can be um, um, focused on struggling learners. So I think <clears throat> there is still space for us to think very hard about what research-informed evidence is and to make sure that we are actually implementing that in the classroom. <clears throat> 
So that's really all I want to say about instruction and the, the broader background. Um, now, look, moving on now, really, to um, developmental disorders and to, ch to the sort of learning difficulties that kids commonly encounter um, that we think probably have a, common, common, um, a cognitive origin. So here are some um, diagnoses that are often um, given to children who are struggling learners um, or who have as one of their areas of difficulty um, learning. Um, children with ADHD often are relatively low achieving in terms of learning. Clearly their primary problems are ones of attentional control, although there is debate about what, that, what those problems originate from. Um, dyslexia, um, or children with reading difficulties. Um, dyscalculia and mathematical difficulties, I'm sure um, Ansari will be talking about these, these types of problems. Um, children with language impairments, specific language impairments is still diagnosed for some children. Um, children with autistic spectrum disorder who often have learning difficulties too. And children with dyspraxia. So there's a whole host of diagnoses. And there's a massive amount of research behind e each of these labels. And often what researchers will do is they'll focus on children who have, um, who reach, who satisfy very stringent research criteria for falling within these categories cleanly. Um, but what we see, actually, and I'll go into a bit more detail about this in a minute, is that actually relatively few children f cleanly fall within these categories. And that's one of the major problems that the field feel faces. So what we have is a, a body of research knowledge which actually isn't representative of the typical struggling learner that we see out there in the classroom um, every day. Now, of course, diagnosis are a good thing, and they are a good thing. There's all sorts of reasons why it's very useful um, for a child to receive a diagnosis by a professional, whether it's an educational psychologist or if it's um, a diagnosis of ADHD from a, um, a paediatric psychiatrist or from CAMS. Firstly, it provides um, a shorthand aid to understand the, understanding those underlying problems. So um, you, it can convey, um, correspond to the knowledge that the, the, the listener may have about what those difficulties are. It may help guide the choice of effective interventions. So for ADHD, for example, we, it immediately raises the possibility that pharmacological drug treatment might be effective. There might be other t t sources of, um, of intervention too. So it's an extremely useful shorthand. And actually, in the case of some of these diagnoses, it might actually be successful at attracting much-needed additional resources to fund extra intervention, whether it's within the classroom or beyond. So we know that some diagnoses will bring, for example, provide funding for maybe part of a, a classroom assistant, to a learning support assistant for a child. So there are all sorts of very reasonable motivations that people have in, in um, getting these types of diagnosis for the child, whether or not it's the school who's driving it, or whether it's the, um, the parents or the child themselves. <clears throat> so we certainly don't want to get rid of diagnosis or something that looked like diagnoses. But there are downsides, and I've already indicated what some of these are. The diagnoses that I listed, um, if we take any pairwise combination, the comorbidity, so the chances are within a child that they have another one of these, um, lie between 20 and 80%. So it's extremely common that a child actually will satisfy the criteria for, what, for another diagnosis too, or in, in many cases, multiple diagnoses. So what do we do with those children? Um, do we add them up? It's, it's difficult to make sense. Moreover, actually, if we look at these different categories, um, so, for example, we look at children with language impairment and children with reading difficulties or dyslexia, we'll see that many of the core cognitive symptoms are actually the same symptoms that appear in the two different cases. So, um, examples in those two cases will be problems in working memory, phonological processing problems, executive functions, and attention. And in fact, those problems might characterise almost all of the children with the diagnosis that we had a listing of here. So it's not surprising that there is comorbidity because it may just be that there's enough symptoms to justify potentially each of these different diagnoses. But it suggests that actually something's going wrong either with the way that we're defining the symptoms or really the categories that we're using. How useful are they in discriminating between children and helping us guide what we do with them that might be different? Presumably the same approach isn't going to work for all kids. Um, the problem isn't just that. So if we take children within 
particular category. So children, um, for example, with a diagnosis of dyslexia. Then we find that if we look at their symptoms, their cognitive symptoms, there may be almost no overlap. And there won't be one, any one symptom um, other than reading difficulty that, for which all of the children with, with that particular diagnosis has. So there is, doesn't seem to be much integrity, much hanging together of the um, cognitive profile within these categories. Um, then we come to how the children arrive at the diagnoses. And we know within the UK, I'm not sure this is true in all national systems, um, but the, the routes to diagnosis are, are haphazard. So it depends. Um, some schools um, are very keen on pursuing them. Some parents are very keen on pursuing diagnoses. Increasingly, I think there's a recognition within the education sector that diagnoses probably don't matter. I'm probably preaching to the converted in many respects today. You'll recognise that actually understanding the, the really the strengths and weaknesses of the individual child rather than a single label is what matters. So there are many children who don't have a diagnosis, but they could do if um, the, someone was actually propelling them in that direction. Um, and they may even um, end up with a, a diagnosis of ADHD and, and um, a pharmacological intervention as a result of that. So we can't really reliably use diagnostic categories as a way of sorting between children and then trying to look at what's different about them because actually they could really pretty much be the same kinds of kids. Um, this makes everything more difficult. So it makes looking at carrying out research into the causes of these diagnoses pretty much impossible because we find that they're more the same than different from each other and we don't know why. And th these are the reasons why. Um, we can't really reliably identify the symptoms. And it does actually make focusing treatment on the kids pretty difficult too. Um, so really, this is the background to the um, increasing concerns that many um, researchers in this field have had over many years. And I'm just going to give you one example for us from a study of our own about how two groups of children that actually present in a really different way in terms of classroom behaviour um, are actually, very, in our, our case, look rather similar to each other. So this is a study that we um, carried out in 2014. It was headed by my colleague, Joni Holmes, um, who's led almost all of the work that I'm going to talk about. And we became interested in comparing the profiles of kids who um, have low working memory. So for many years, we've been interested in those children, the sort of bottom 15% of children within the classroom who've got the lowest working memory. And we know quite a lot about those children, and their symptoms are shown in the, that, that lower list there. So we know that they do poorly in school. So 80% of them will have problems in reading or maths, or typically both. Um, we know they have low working memory because that's how we selected them. We know that they're highly inattentive. So if we get teachers or parents to rate them, they describe them as, as failing to be able to maintain focus on ongoing tasks. They're forgetful, all of those types of characteristics. And um, there's a slight dominance of males. So slightly more boys than girls, but um, pretty much equal. Um, when they present in the classroom, they're just the standard struggling learner. You usually find them in the, the small group of children who aren't doing very well in the classroom. Um, they're not, they don't present typically with behaviour problems. Um, their social integration is good, so their peer relationships are good. Um, they don't display um, particularly hyperactive or irritable behaviours. So they, they're quite easy to tolerate within the classroom, as you know. Um, and contrast those with children with ADHD. Now, <coughs> children with ADHD have, they're, they're also rated as inattentive, but also as impulsive and hyperactive. And that often is the presenting symptom which really drives the need for um, attention and diagnosis and, and intervention because they're very difficult to handle, or they can be difficult to handle. Um, it turns out that actually, probably the most common symptom in, in terms of their cognitive profile is they also have low working memory. So all, almost all these children have low working memory. Um, we know that they have problems in almost all executive functions, whether it's planning or shifting, um, inhibitory control, probably to no greater extent than working memory, but they have problems in executive functions. And um, there appear to be many more males than females, m many more boys than girls. Though actually, if you do community screening based on um, ratings, then it's, it's a bit more balanced. But certainly when exhibited by boys, these behaviours are quite a lot more annoying than they are by girls, um, I think is, is the case. So um, 
We were interested actually in the, the correspondence between these two different groups. So in many respects, they seem the same. In fact, the only thing really that might distinguish these children is hyperactivity. Um, so we carried out a study, quite a large study. We looked at 50 kids with low working memory and compared them with 80 children with a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, they were all given um, psychostimulant medication. It was um, fast release medication. We took them um, off their medication 24 hours before we actually tested them and the medication was then metabolised out of their system so it doesn't affect their cognitive function. And then in most cases, the school nurse or someone equivalent was there with the medication as we came out of the testing session, very keen to re-administer it. So, um, but they, they were medication free at the time of testing. So first thing we did um, was to look at, can I do, I'm just wondering whether I can get a, so there's a pointer here, is there? Yeah, I can see it, just. Right, so what we have here is rating scales um, on, the, on the children. We have three groups of children. We have children with ADHD, and um, children with low working memory, and then we just have regular kids. And um, the scores here, the um, T scores, which mean that the um, appropriate level for the age um, of descriptions of behaviour are 50. So age appropriate levels would be 50. Elevated levels are um, higher than 50 or higher than 60, really are levels of problem behaviours that are above and beyond what you'd expect for age. So these, these high scores are problem scores, and um, anything below um, 50 is um, better than we would expect. So let's have a look. Let's firstly look at um, inattention. Sorry, this is a bit weedy. I won't even bother. Um, so what we can see is that the ADHD and the low working memory children are pretty, pretty much similar to each other. You can't really distinguish them. Um, but the uh, ADHD children are more hyperactive, you see the red bar is higher than the blue bar, and they're also more oppositional. Um, and the, the other scale is just a composite of those two. So um, that's pretty much as we'd expect. How are they um, in other respects? Well, we, actually their working memory was absolutely equivalent. I've forgotten to put that slide in. Let's look at their, their um, academic performance too. Um, so the ADHD children were in receipt of um, extra classroom support, learning support to compensate for their problems. But what we can see if we look at the left-hand bars is actually the learning difficulties of the two groups can't be distinguished. So these are standard scores, so scores of 85 and below are lower than we would expect is typical for a, a child's age. And what we can see is both the ADHD and low working memory children are struggling in both reading and maths. Um, they're both pretty much down in verbal IQ and performance IQ too. So in cognitive terms, these children actually can't be distinguished. The only thing they can be distinguished on by our measures, and we've also given them a very large battery of executive function tests, and they're, they're the same with one exception, which I'll tell you about at the moment. What distinguishes them is their hyperactive and impulsive behaviour. And in the executive function measures, the only test um, that they, the ADHD and the low working memory children were distinguished on was the tower test, which is where the child has to follow certain rules about moving um, objects to get to a goal state. And um, the uh, ADHD children had really fast solution times because they broke all the rules. They just used to take the, took the pile of hoops and they put it on the, ta the target end, and it, um, whereas the, the low working memory children didn't. So it's a, just another exhibition, really, of this, kind of this impulsive behaviour, this failure to inhibit getting to a, a desired goal, a desired end state quickly um, without heeding the consequences. So, um, and this really was the early, early, our earliest stages of trying to think about how we conceive of this, this mess of diagnosis, really, and how we can make sense and find some order within the data that might simplify it. And it seems that there are really two dimensions that have been exposed, really, when we look at these two groups of children. And the first dimension are executive skills or executive functions, and these include working memory and planning and inhibitory control, um, attentional controls, the, the ability to stay focused on task. And this dimension appears to be impaired both in children with working memory problems and in kids with ADHD. Even though they look very different, there's no difference in these types of skills. And then there's a second dimension of hyperactivity and impulsivity. It doesn't seem to predict learning problems, but it's a very distinctive feature. It's an additional problem that the kids with ADHD have. 
So um, despite the huge variability actually in individual children, despite the variability in the way that these children seem, when we tested them, they really do seem different as well as they do in the, in the classroom. We can see that this, it, it, their problems actually boil down to two ra rather simple um, areas. So is that useful to know? So um, we were interested in, in finding a different way of looking at this. So we were stuck in the old ways, really, and I think actually a lot of this field still is, of looking at children with a particular, within a diagnostic category, kids with ADHD, for example, and looking at their cognitive problems and trying to make sense, and then maybe comparing it with kids in a different, different diagnostic category, and, and then trying to massively blend the two together. And we wondered whether... It's, we should just put aside diagnosis and instead just to look at struggling learners. Actually, the way that we um, define that was children with problems in attention, learning and or memory. And we created um, CALM, uh, which is um, this, uh, a research clinic which is based at the um, Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. Um, it's just a bit of, it was a scrubby little outbuilding, actually, and we re refurbished it so it's sort of child and family friendly. And when I joined the unit, its acronym was SWAMP. <laughs> and it was the South Wing, and then no one could remember what the rest of the acronym was. But it's where we used to send the graduate students when they'd outstayed their welcome. So after three years, they still hadn't submitted. We used to send them there, and it was barely heated, and it was damp on the walls. And um, I thought it was awful to have such a dismal um, acronym. So I was determined that we would do better in our developmental research facility. So it's the Centre for Attention, Learning and Memory, but w the clinic really is, um, recruits children who have problems in, in one of those three areas or are considered to, to have them by in, um, practitioners in children's services who are working to support those particular children. Um, we established the clinic in September 2014. Um, we really worried, actually, about how we were going to bring recruit. Um, Cambridge isn't a very big um, city and we, we thought, you know, how can we actually encourage these families to come in and, and test their kids? But it turned out it just wasn't a problem at all. And you can see actually in um, three, well, less than three years, we've recruited 460 kids. Um, it turns out there are a lot of struggling learners in Cambridgeshire and um, bordering counties. Um, also, um, a lot of the children who do have diagnosis, for example, kids with AD ADHD, at the time weren't being funded for cognitive workups um, separately by the CAM service. So they were very keen to come to our clinics that we could actually provide them with cognitive profiles, which we then gave back to the referring agents. So let me tell you a bit about the clinic. So what we're doing is we're recruiting children who have... Um, difficulties in attention, learning and or memory, and really from anyone who works with children professionally. Um, so we have it from um, schools, ed psychs, SENCOs, mental health services, quite a lot from CAMS, clinical psychologists, paediatricians, um, speech and language <coughs> therapists. And we take kids from 5 to 18 years, though most of the kids are actually are between 7 and 14 years, probably for practical reasons. Um, they come to the clinic for one um, testing session, which is three hours, um, and the, a parent or, or um, caregiver comes along with them. They separately consent, so the, the referrer encourages them or provides them with information about the study, and then they separately consent to come. Um, they have a cognitive assessment, and at the same time, we, um, we get the parents to fill in a huge number of um, questionnaires while the kids are actually being tested just the other side of the wall. Um, and we get them to spit in the pot, so we take saliva samples and we're going to be carrying out genetic analysis. It turns out the kids are very keen on doing that, so we have very compli high compliance rates. So we've, all, we've got a lot, a lot of saliva from a lot of children. <laughs> Not on site anymore. Um, and um, but the question we're asking is, we, we put diagnosis aside, that we actually collect information on diagnosis, and I'll tell you something about it in a minute. We ask what dimensions of cognition, learning, behaviour and brain structure, because we do actually invite these kids to come back for a brain scan, um, distinguish between these children. So it's really a bottom-up, data-driven approach here. So we collect all this information, and we look at the data and say, OK, what comes out? What are the dimensions that distinguish children? Can we simplify the haphazard routes, everything that, that's been known and not known about the children previously. Can we just look at, at their performance in these different areas and make sense of it? And uh, these are the domains that we look at. So we look at um, cognition, 
Um, we take the, those, those measures that are shown in blue. We behavior, and those are the behavior ratings of the parents. Um, when they come for a scan, we look at their brain structure. Um, we look at um, gray matter, we look at white matter, so these are the information highways within the brain. We look at resting states, the patterns of functional changing brain activity. And um, when the children just have their eyes closed in the scanner, um, um, in the future we'll, we'll be carrying out genetic analysis. We're looking at learning. And we want to know how, th how these fit, fit together, though. Actually, we're starting off with cognition. So that's, that's the area that we know most about. And we're trying to understand what the cognitive dimensions are first and then fitting in the other pieces. And I'm just going to really, for the rest of the talk, very briefly tell you about that. Here's the referral information. And whenever I show a slide, there's a, number, a different number of kids on the slide. It's never 460. But anyway, this was based on 448, this particular cutoff in time. On the left, we see the referrers. Um, and what we can see is that um, the most common category are education referrals. So you see that the large, um, over half of the kids were referred by SENCOs, local SENCOs. Um, we collect diagnostic information. Some of the kids have um, one, two, three diagnoses, and I've just drawn boxes around the, the, the most common ones. Um, we have about 100 kids who've either or probably got a diagnosis of, of ADHD, so we catch them just before, after the nurse, ADHD nurse practitioner has seen them, but before they've had their full workup, and those are the 35 kids. A lot of the kids have um, a comorbidity of autism, though we, the, being, being autistic isn't in itself a reason to come to the clinic, but it often accompanies the attention, learning and memory problems, and quite a large proportion of the kids have a history of speech and language problems. We have increasing numbers of referrals from SLTs. Okay, so if we take all of these um, data together, what we can do, one first thing we can do is just look at the profiles, the average profiles of this sample. And these are um, Z scores. So these are the average scores expressing standard deviation units because the measures are on different scales. I'm very pleased with these plots, but I found out that my lab been referring to these as soup plots in a slightly derogatory way. Um, but they are a good, simple way of actually looking at where the big, biggest areas of problem are. Um, what we can see is that the, um, the learning scores, so um, spelling, reading, and maths, are the lowest scores. These are the areas in which the kids are performing more, most poorly, which isn't surprising. That's what we would expect given the referral route. Um, vocabulary is the first measure, though. You, you can see that these kids, on average, don't have a problem with our vocabulary measure. Um, they may have language problems, but in terms of this crude vocabulary measure, they're fine. If we look at the remaining cognitive measures, which fall in the areas of phonological processing, um, working in episodic memory and fluid intelligence, we'll see that they're down relative to um, the population norms. They're about half a standard deviation down. So they fall probably in the, the bottom 30% for the population, maybe about bottom 25%. Um, and um, they, they have problems, and there's quite a large amount of variability within them. But their learning problems, in a sense, are bigger than their cognitive problems. That's the first thing we know. Um, then we can do all sorts of things. This, I've just, this is just showing you spaghetti, just to give you some idea about how we can carve the data up. We can look at... Um, whether or not the kids have all sorts of combinations of low scores. And um, below 86 is just a, a deficit in each of these areas. So you can see the yellow line, which is at the bot which bottom, which is the worst cognitive profile, is the kids who are doing poorly in vocabulary, reading, and maths. Um, what you can see is that there's some very different levels of performance in there. So the, all of the kids, and if we um, consider their learning, they're not doing the same. So we have some different cognitive profiles in here. I'm just going to pull out a couple of comparisons that might be of interest. First is just a real surprise to us, which is that 30% of these kids we can't find anything wrong with. <clears throat> Even though it doesn't mean that there isn't anything wrong with them, it just means that we can't find anything wrong with them. And that's true in terms of all the cognitive measures that we look at. And then we thought, well, maybe these are, just haven't, these are kids with huge behaviour problems. They don't have cognitive problems, but actually their behaviour is also entirely age-appropriate. Um, we've wondered whether it might be a Cambridge factor. Um, expectations can be quite high in some parts of our town. So, um, though I think it is actually quite um, typical of these types of studies that um, often the kids that are referred, it's, it's relatively difficult to find their deficits. For us, it's relatively convenient, as well as for the children, I guess, um, because we have a natural comparison group within our data set. 
recruited from the same sources. Um, now have a look at the um, bottom two plots, the yellow and the, um, the red lines. The yellow line uh, is the main performance of the children who are struggling in language reading and maths, and the red line, the children who are struggling in language and maths, with no reading problems. And what we can see is that those two plots diverge. The kids who have additional reading problems are the ones that have problems with rapid naming. So that's um, sort of phonological retrieval and fluency speed of being able to access phonological representations and produce them. So as the sanity check, that makes sense. That, that is an ability we would expect to go along with reading ability. Um, but this is all about... this. I'm um, doing really what the field has always done, which is segmenting the children into different groups. And what we want to do is to look at dimensions. We want to look at uh, sort of funnels of... Um, behaviour or abilities and how we might be able to profile children along those. And to do that, we used a different approach, which was structural equation modelling. So we took all of the measures, that we, the cognitive measures that, that we'd um, collected, and we looked at the most economical way of how they could be grouped along dimensions. And um, don't be put off by this slide, because actually it's all quite simple. Um, so the convention with structural equation modelling, many of you will know, is that the observed variables are shown as rectangles, but the underlying constructs, that is, what, what, what's common to different observed variables, are shown as ellipses. So um, what we have here, so let's just look at the ellipses because they're all that matters. Um, what we have here down on the bottom left, we have a phonological ability. And we can see that's associated with phonological awareness skills, um, alliteration, rapid naming. It's also associated with verbal aspects of working memory. So it suggests that, sadly, working memory actually isn't that special. It's just part of a verbal, general verbal ability, a, a, a phonological construct that influences that, the short-term memory system, but um, it, it isn't itself distinct. If we look at... Um, that phonological dimensions. This is dimension along, along which we can um, children will vary. We can see it's very strongly associated with language, lang children's language abilities, and very strongly associated with reading. And that's what we might expect. We know that th these are basic verbal skills and verbal learning. They go together. And um, if we go above the phonological. Um, dimension now, we can see there's another one which is executive, it's really executive visuospatial type of skills. Um, so for example, problem solving, matrix reasoning that sort of Raven's matrices type of test where the children are looking for patterns in puzzles and missing segments that complete patterns and spatial aspects of working memory are what load on that particular factor. So it's that ability to understand and make sense of and represent visuospatial information and to use that to make inferences. And that's that second dimension. And here's really the surprise in our data. What we found was that that was really strongly related to maths. Um, and the, actually, the pathways to learning that are shown here are, are quite separate. So we don't find, although um, the executive and phonological dimensions are heavily correlated, they're not the same as each other. So it's actually very useful to know about both of those things, both of those measures for an individual child, to actually get a handle on what their likely learning difficulties might be. So some children might be relatively strong on the executive end and relatively weak on the phonological end, in which case they might not manifest as having maths problems. Um, so these, these data suggest that Actually, despite, despite to remember that, that the diagnostic information, the referral information, the, the heterogeneity in this sample, um, it boils down to really quite simple dimensions that are distinguishing between the children. Can we fit behaviour in on this model? Okay, so if we look at <clears throat> the problem behaviours that the parents, the teachers say that the children exhibit, can we track where they come from too? And um, the good news is that we can. So this is the same models. The cognitive model and learning model is fixed. They're the same parameter weights. But now we have two dimensions, if you can see, pointing up at the top. So we have um, a dimension of inattentive behaviour. This is based on the parents' descriptions of the children as being highly inattentive or not. And executive behaviour is the extent to which um, the children are able to shift attention when appropriate, to be selective in what they do, to inhibit behaviour 
um, responses when, when appropriate to do so. And what we find is that the um, inattentive behaviour is most heavily correlated with the executive spatial dimension. And, um, and that, of course, is the one that feeds through most strongly to maths, and that maths ability is directly um, linked to these um, problem executive behaviours. And this um, is the second surprise of these data, really, for us. Um, we thought long and hard about this, and we do wonder whether there's something about the nature of maths, the abstract nature uh, of maths, and the fact that the child ultimately has to hold in their head and to carry out computations and manipulations, um, often visual spatially, that is particularly prey to disruption if the child isn't able to maintain an attentional focus. Whereas if we take language-related activities and reading, there are prompts, there are environmental inputs that may be much more compelling, that might allow the child to recover more if there's been an attentional lapse. That's really just post hoc speculation. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay, let me just... Get, so the dimensions we've looked at so far, um, there appears to be um, <coughs> three dimensions um, and... Um, that we've identified in these kids. I've just talked about two of them, phonological dimension, phonological skills through to reading and language, executive spatial dimension associated with an attention and maths problems, and then a third dimension, which is that of hyperactivity. I haven't got time to talk about it today, but we also find there's no cognitive symptoms associated with this, but the kids that are highly hi hyperactive, they may have ADHD, they may not have. We still have hyperactivity. Um, present within the sample, have problems with social pragmatic aspects of communication. So parents report problems in appropriate choice of communicative um, approaches in terms of understanding of others, of supplying information in an appropriate way for a particular social context, for promoting easy social interaction. So it's very different from language knowledge, as it were. It's not, nothing to do with vocabulary. It's to do with the, the use of, of language in communication. And what we find is it's extremely closely locked with hyperactivity. And that's um, another unexpected feature of the data that we're looking at very closely as we move forward. Right, I'm just going to say something very briefly about the brain. So, so far I've talked about cognition, dimensions of cognitive problems within the sample, and we've, put, um, we've linked um, behaviour in. Remember, we, we've got um, scanning information, neuroimaging information on these kids too. Um, I'm not a neuroimager, I'm just um, masquerading here really, but my colleagues, um, Joe Battelle and Duncan Astor are. And um, they ask the questions, the question of our diffusion weighted imaging, which tells us about the white matter tracks that connect different areas within the children's brain. Whether or not, if we characterise the efficiency with which those white matter tracks are organised within the children's brain using network theory, whether or not we can, they're linked with their um, maths and reading abilities. So um, they use um, graph theory to look at the white matter network structure um, from the MRI scans that we, that we took. And the network structure is um, achieved by looking at um, particular key areas um, based on the MRI scans in which the um, white matter tracks can be associated with multiple different points within the brain. I'll show you an image in a, in a minute which will um, clarify. So there's lots of work being done, and recently a lot of it comes from Cambridge, actually from Ed, Ed Bulmore's lab, um, identifying what the optimal network structure is for the brain, and the most efficient. And actually, interesting, the same formalisation accounts to, for example, flight patterns. You've seen the, the flight patterns and the, um, the glossy brochures um, from the airline companies showing, showing the, 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 the large numbers of local flights and then the few long-distance flights. That particular property is known as small world organisation and it's, it's very high um, local connectivity with a few hubs and then occasional some long-distance connections. And networks that have that property um, provide optimal um, minimum distances for anyone to travel between to any two random points within the network. So um, there's a huge interest at the moment in applying this theory to the um, functional efficiency of the brain. I've just exhausted all my knowledge by describing that. Um, this is, um, and uh, the, the network structure um, of a brain is, is referred to as the connectome, and in this case the structural connectome because we're looking at the white matter highways. Um, brain regions are the nodes 
the, the circles represented. This is just the average of all the children. And um, the, the, um, the edges the, are the connections, the, the white matter pathways between these different critical points within the brain. And the nodes shown in blue are what call rich, what's known as rich club nodes, rich club members. And they're the nodes that have really high levels of connectivity. So they're connected to lots of different areas. So we can distinguish between um, white nodes, which are connected to some, some other areas, and blue nodes, which are those, those densities. They're like, they're like the Heathrow airports. So <coughs> connected to, to everything. Um, and so we have actually 19 rich club members um, within this, this group average connectome. So then we can look at the connectomes for individual children and actually look at whether any of these uh, mathematical properties, so for example, um, the, the, the measure of connectivity of individual nodes or the number of connections, can they, can they predict reading or maths abilities? And it turns out they can. So <laughs> children um, with more efficient networks, that is more rich club nodes and um, uh, fewer long-term connections and large numbers of local connections um, to, are, are the children with higher reading and math scores. So they have greater and more efficient connectivity. It's not just greater connectivity because the connections don't go everywhere, but they um, conform to these ideas, these um, concepts of optimal organisation. Um, and this, change, this suggests that changes in sort of large-scale brain organisation, because what you've seen is that this spans the whole brain, so we're not looking at you know, little specialised areas to do with reading, are really much more important during learning than the highly specialised areas that we have been associated with reading and, and maths in adults. Um, we have compared this method against the traditional methods where you look at particular regions of interest that you predefined areas in which you might find differences. And we find no differences. So we only find differences in, in this large-scale organisation. Why, why does it spread over the whole brain? Well, it may be because actually when the child's learning, there's lots of different cognitive systems are engaged. So the child, it's phonological processing, it's executive functions, it's a motivation system. And that all of those... Um, systems together actually correspond to the entire brain network. So maybe that's why actually it's so far reaching. This is just speculation. Um, how am I for time? Should I finish now? Five minutes. Shall I just tell you something quickly about cognitive training? Right. Um, right. Cognitive training. So working memory um, is probably one of the best predictors of um, academic learning. That's why in, t in um, test instruments such as the WISC, working memories become more and more important as, as governing the, the indices because it's a very good indicator of how the kids going to, the children are going to do it academically. So um, it'd be, when um, training paradigms were first developed, working memory training paradigms, an obvious question was, OK, can we train it? And will that improve edu the associated educational outcomes? So you make working memory better. Can we make reading and maths better at the same time? And... Uh, this is a very short account of a very long story. Um, so this is, um, and um, we're just about to submit this paper, which has um, been f forever in the, in the, in the thinking. Um, this is how it looks. So training does per boost performance on tasks that are similar to those in the, in the training um, programme, but they have to be quite similar. And um, if, it, if those tasks are um, working memory activities that we often carry out, like digit span, digit span seems a bit rarefied, but actually we often remember phone numbers and pin codes and passwords. So um, that ability to store verbal sequences is something that we have a highly specialised short-term memory system for in place anyway. Actually, we can train on, on those tasks and it doesn't lead to improved performance. And that's probably because we've already got a system that's already been highly practiced and articulated. It works very well. So we don't need to learn to do anything new. So working memory training actually only seems to work if we use activities that are quite unfamiliar. So if we give backward recall, that's a good one, reverse, um, backward digit span, remember a sequence of digits backwards. Well, we're not very good at doing that, and we have to figure out a new way to do that. And it turns out people do it in different ways. Now, that does, lead to, that does lead to training, but only in other backward span tasks. So what we get is very specific learning 
of strange and unfamiliar tasks. Um, so this is our proposal. So in working memory training, what the um, participants do, actually, they learn to do something new. And we call this a novel cognitive routine. So you have to set up a, a set of instructions which will marshal existing processes that will allow you to accomplish this task. So for backward recall, we seem to spin through to the end of the final item, then we go through to the penultimate item and backwards, for example. Other people do it in different ways. So during training, we have to learn a new cognitive routine. This will apply to other tasks, but only if they have the same task demands. Critically, what we found is that the magnitude of transfer that you find for these strange and unusual tasks is entirely predicted by the child's fluid intelligence, or IQ. So it's, it's not fueled by the working memory system itself. It's almost like a problem-solving ability. Can you learn to do something strange and new? And that's what working memory training seems to do. So it doesn't have any effect on basic working memory capacity, and therefore it's not surprising that actually it has no impact on learning. And there's very little systematic evidence from meta-analyses and reviews <coughs> that, that this type of intensive training has any long-term educational benefits. There have been positive results, but largely they haven't been replicated. So... Um, it doesn't look like cognitive training is going to be um, a panacea for, um, well, this type of cognitive training anyway, for cognitive deficits. So, final slide. How does this help us help the struggling learner if we take all this together? Well, we hope, and this is um, going back to our CALM project, that by looking at, boiling down, looking very simply at dimensions of strengths and weaknesses, we might, don't have to use all of these measures for the kids. We can actually just boil them down to, to good ones that predict the dimensions. We could um, add to or maybe even replace conventional diagnoses where they exist. So what we'd be able to say is, right, for this child, here's their risk profile. This is what they're struggling with, and this is what they're likely to struggle with most in terms of learning. What can we do about it? When it comes to instruction, to either the routine instruction provided in school or the additional help focused on what we know about the struggles of the individual child, we need to be guided by evidence. Um, and I've already talked about the oral language and phonological abilities training. That does seem to work, but it may be because it's just at that particular set, developmentally sensitive period. Four or five years of age, it might work. Pretty sure it won't do later on. Um, and I'd be guided by evidence that probably we can't increase working memory capacity. So um, attempting to do that as a solution to, to learning problems uh, probably won't work. What we can do, and this is really where I started off, is to encourage children who have persisting cognitive problems, and I'm particularly thinking of older children here, to develop compensatory skills and strategies. So um, with a PhD student... Um, Cartini, we looked at um, undergraduate students at York who had dyslexia. They had done incredibly well. It's a competitive university to get, to get into, as many of you know. They were almost all to be found in the physics and chemistry departments. Um, and um, what we did was we asked them about the sorts of strategies they used and we looked at their cognitive profiles. And what we found was there were some very consistent strategies and the children were the students, had developed effective strategies that really played to their own strengths. Um, they did it through self-discovery um, with a bit of guidance, and my feeling is that that's one of the areas in which we really should be focusing our energies. And when I first met Caroline and Mary um, 10 years ago, they came to visit us um, before Learners was called Learners anyway, I think. And they came to visit Alan Badley and I um, in York, and we were really interested then in looking at strategies and seeing if we could get internet data, actually, just self-report data from teenagers, those who, struggled, who had struggled at learning, asking them what it is that they, they did that, that was effective. And then we could maybe even match their cognitive profiles, and other kids who have the same cognitive profiles, we could say, well, other kids like you have found this useful, and to do that. And uh, we still haven't done that, and I do th think after all um, this research, it still would be um, a really useful way to go to arm the kids themselves with strategies that we, we could, um, that will make them effective learners independently. So I think there may well be more than one way to learn, as you know.